Hello, I'm Ewan McPhee and I'm a local preacher in the Falmouth and Granite Methodist Circuit. Welcome to Wednesday Worship. As we are now in the period of Pentecost, and we will be looking at God's Holy Spirit at work in us. And the main theme for today is the fruit of the Spirit, love. First of all, I would like to share a sonnet written by Malcolm Gitt, which is a celebration of Pentecost. Today we feel the wind beneath our wings. Today the hidden fountain flows and plays. Today the church draws breath at last and sings, as every flame becomes a tongue of praise. This is a feast of fire, air and water, poured out and breathed and kindled into earth. The earth herself awakens to her maker, translated out of death and into birth. The right words come today in their right order, and every word spells freedom and release. Today the gospel crosses every border, all tongues are loosened by the Prince of Peace. Today the lost are found in his translation, whose mother tongue is love in every nation. And now Nona is going to share a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in the mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. So that reading from Corinthians certainly spells out all the attributes of love and uh, gives us plenty of cause to reflect on how well we match up to all of those criteria. In the Gospel of Matthew, we also read an account of Jesus uh, sharing with the Pharisees a challenging question which was put to him about what is the greatest commandment. So in Matthew 22, 34-40 we read, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The noticeable thing about what Jesus said is that we should love the Lord your God with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our mind. It's not just a, an intellectual exercise. It's not just an emotion from the heart. It's all of those things. Love should come from every part of us. And the second commandment is love your neighbour as yourself. And it's easy to glide over that and recognise the truth of loving our neighbours. And we do try to do that in many ways. But it's important to note the condition of that love for neighbour. Love your neighbour as yourself. There are many people in this world who are really dissatisfied with their own position in life. They might be rather unhappy with the bodies that they are in, the conditions of life and the people who are part of their family relationships or friends. And it raises the question, if they are unable to love themselves, how can they love anyone else? So that is a real challenge to all of us, that hierarchy of love, to love God, love our neighbour and to love ourselves. As many of you will recognise, we are shortly about to host the G7 summit here in Cornwall and that is a prelude to the meeting in Glasgow, COP26, when the nations of the world will seek to reach some resolution of actions that need to be taken to combat climate change. In the light of that, I'd like to suggest that part of our command to love God includes loving all that God has created. So how does our love for creation get exhibited? Last week in the Church Times there was an interview with Ruth Jarman, an environmental activist and Christian. And she has been a member of Green Christian and an environmental activist for many years. She has been involved in non-violent direct action with Christian Climate Action and the Extinction Rebellion events in London, where she was arrested and appeared before the courts. Whilst many people might have doubts about the validity of this kind of direct action, there is no doubting the fire and the passion, and yes, the love that drives Ruth's activism. So here is a short extract from her interview in, with the Church Times. When asked why don't more Christians take part in protesting against climate change and the destruction of creation, she replied, Oh, if only the Church would wake up and respond to the cry of the earth and the call of God. But we're fallen, aren't we? sleepily embedded in the comfort of our 21st century privileged Western lives. We don't just need political, economic, technological and consumer transformation, but also spiritual transformation. This is the church's arena and we need to get to work. She went on to say, I'd like to see the church rise up, clearly state its allegiance to God take up its prophetic duty and rebel against a system that is destroying what God has made. So 
So it goes on to say, our motivation should be love, shouldn't it? Not fear for our survival. Look at the beauty of God's creation made out of love. We should be giving our lives to till and keep the garden as a simple response to the love of God for us. Ruth went on to say that at a particularly distressing time in my life, my fear and sadness were suddenly overwhelmed by a sense of being profoundly loved. I get inklings of the divine when experiencing beauty and love in music or nature or the loyalty of friends. Playing duets with one of my children is the highlight of my day. And finally she said, Romans 8, 38-39 gives me hope, where it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in the creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I would like to close with a prayer by Thomas Akempis. As yet my love is weak, my heart is imperfect, and so I have great need of your strength and comfort. Visit me often, I pray, and instruct me in the way of your laws. Set me free from all evil passions and heal my heart from all immoral desires. And thus, healed and cleansed in spirit, may I learn how blissful it is to plunge into the depths of your love. Let your love dissolve my hard heart. Let your love raise me above myself. Let your love reveal to me joy beyond imagination. Let my soul exhaust itself in singing the praises of your love. Let me love you more than I love myself, and let me love myself only for your sake. And let me see your love shining in the hearts of all people, that I may love them as I love you. Amen.